Good morning. <laughs> I know. My, kin- my kids call that cringe. I think that's the correct definition. <laughs> yes, correct. I'm very good at cringe. <laughs> Apparently. Hey, welcome to New City. We're glad you're here. My name is Ryan, and I get to read scripture today, which is awesome. Uh, I would encourage you to reread Philippians 2, 5 through 11, because that is rad. I can't believe that you can even not just not preach it. It was just on the screen. I was and, tempted. I mean, it's a good one. So the implications of that verse are crazy. But we get to go back to Romans. So if you'll stand with me, if you were here last year and you went through Romans, like Nick just loved it too much. He just had to bring it back <laughs> up again. Right. And uh, if, if you want to open a pew Bible, you can't, or I'm sorry, if you want to open interlocking church chair Bible, um, it's on page 944. We're in Romans 8. Dating me. What's a pew? Romans 8, verse 18 is headed future glory. Nicely added. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience." The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. Well, nothing reveals the good, the bad, and the ugly of the human heart like suffering does, right? Um, When you suffer, and it's the inevitable reality of life, um, you find out who you really are. It takes us down to the very studs. Outside of our greatest enemy, death, suffering is one of the great enemies of the human experience, right? It's because it's a type of living death, if you think about it. It's a way where we experience the the full weight of the fallenness and the brokenness of the world in both big and small ways. Suffering shows us who we really are. And sometimes that's really encouraging, right? You go through suffering and you get to see, hey, the Lord has been growing some character in me, like some some staying power and some grit. And then in another moment, you find that you begin to suffer and it feels like the ha- your hands fly off the steering wheel of your life. You cover your eyes and go careening off the path. Suffering shows us everything. And the weird thing about suffering is that it's sort of agnostic, right? You don't, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian, it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, it doesn't matter where you come from, you are going to suffer in this world. It is the non-negotiable piece of the human experience that all of us are experiencing. But listen to this, only Christians can suffer with real hope. You see, that's the great gift of the gospel. The Apostle Paul, writing these words, has the audacity in verse 18 to say to us of maybe most wanted enemy number two in the universe to death, suffering, he looks at that and says, it's not even worth comparing to the glory to come? Not worth comparing? Like, I'm, I'm looking around this room right now, and listen, we've walked some life together. Some of us, some of you, have suffered. You've experienced loss, grief, pain, hopelessness, difficulty. You have experienced suffering. But in that suffering, here's what I also know. 
You suffering with Jesus has made suffering a different experience than for anybody else in the world. Jesus loves to show up with His suffering people. Why? Because He Himself is the suffering servant. He Himself is the man of sorrows who partners with us in our iniquities and our grief. What God but God in flesh would subject Himself to suffering. That's who you have in Jesus Christ, is the God who does not stand off to the side of suffering and go, okay, here, you got to deal with your stuff. No, no, no. He is the God who descends into suffering to bear with His people and walk through it together. And one of the main gifts that comes with the hope of the gospel is future glory. Like that a day is coming when we're going to look back and go, what was that called again? Was it, was it suffering? I don't even remember. Let's move. Like a day is coming when the glory of Jesus is so strong in our lives that the, the Bible would say that He is going to glorify us. And that suffering will be a distant memory. And what the Apostle Paul wants to do in this text is help us grab hold of that future glory and live in present suffering in a different way. And that is the main point of our text today. Future glory frames present suffering. So, let's walk it through. Just three points today, beginning in verse 18. Point number one, the paradigm for suffering. Read with me again in God's Word. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So let's work it through. That initial phrase there in verse 18, for I consider, um, that's the Greek word here, I reason, or um, uh, some translations may even render this, I reckon, right? If you're from the South, you may read this and go, well, I reckon that I wouldn't consider the sufferings, right? Um, and when he says, he, he reasons that the sufferings, the difficulties of life, of this present time, he doesn't just mean that moment. He means the present age, right? So that's your suffering and my suffering. As we live in this time in world history when Jesus has died on the cross and he has robbed death of its sting and its teeth, but there's still some stuff to be set in order. In this present time, he's saying all of that suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There he's talking about the end, right? The glory that's coming in Jesus. There's so much beauty here for us to think about. Like, when we suffer in the present time, here's what I know happens. It is not difficult to consider or think about the suffering, right? You don't have to think about it, right? When you're suffering, you wake up in the morning, and you get about one or two seconds of mental clarity, and then what happens? You feel the weight and the fog of the suffering come in. But in t- that's not hard, but intuitively we do stop considering the glory and the hope of the gospel. Like it is very easy and intuitive to think about the suffering, but it is not easy and intuitive in a broken world to think on the gospel. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing right here. He's saying, when I consider the gospel, when I consider what's coming because of the gospel, then suffering starts to seem a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. It's important that you know when he talks about suffering right here, he's talking at least on two levels. In the previous section in Romans chapter 8, he was talking about the suffering of transformation as a Christian right? That journey of going back and forth, like it's, it's sort of up into the right, more like Jesus, but if you zoom in on the graph, it looks a little bit like this, right? He was just talking about that, but then it seems in this section that he flips to talking about the general suffering of life, right? Not just the difficulty of change, but the difficulty of life in a broken world. Paul is operating 
from a gospel logic or a gospel paradigm. You know what a paradigm is? Think, think about this, right? If you wear glasses or contacts in the room, you don't look at glasses, right? What do you do? You look through glasses. They are the lenses by which you're able to see everything else. And that's where Paul goes in suffering. He says, I need you to put your gospel lenses, your gospel paradigm back on so that you can begin to see this in its proper context. And Paul wants us to see it in an eternal, conf- in an eternal context. The glory that is to be revealed to us. Like if you were to sit down and you were to start to make a list of all the ways that you've suffered, man, that would be a hard list to make, wouldn't it? All the losses, all the lows. And you start making a list. And then you were to sit down and honestly make a list of all that comes with glory of all that God has promised in His Word that will come to us in the days to come. Ephesians 3 would say He will spend an eternity showing the riches of His kindness to His people. Believe it or not, the list of glory would outweigh the list of sufferings. That's what Paul is saying right here. He's like, man, when I sit down and I consider my own sufferings, at some point, I just put the pen down. Why? Because glory is so grand. Can I remind you and encourage you, Christian, of an eternal perspective, of a a paradigm for suffering this morning? You will see full redemption over all the suffering in your life. Maybe not in this age, but listen, in the age to come, God will pay every tear back. He will make every sad thing come untrue, as J.R.R. Tolkien famously says. Glory is coming for the Christian. And you may say, well, Nick, that doesn't change much about the difficulty of what I'm facing. No, 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 what you're facing is difficult, but you have to view it in a context. See, a, a big thing in a little context is a big thing, but a seemingly big thing in an infinite context, it's not nearly as big of a thing. It allows us to get our minds and our hearts around the fact that this is not all there is to the story, that glory is coming for the people of God. Can I ask you this morning, what is your paradigm for suffering? Some of you are suffering right now and you've taken your hands off the wheel. You've sort of given up. You've let go of the hope of the promises of God. And what Jesus wants for you today is to grab back onto the promises. If you forget the glory that's to be revealed, you're not going to make it. And He wants you to make it. If we don't view suffering in light of future glory, then we, we will run half-hearted through the difficulties of life. But here's what's beautiful. When you take hold of the promises of future glory, guess what begins to happen? You start to suffer well. Not tritely. You don't go, man, this isn't sad at all. I don't even care about this. No, you go, man, we are perplexed, but not crushed. We're in it. This is hard. But listen, we are walking through this with God. Do you know that because every type of person experiences suffering, one of the main ways that you can be a witness to the power of the gospel is to suffer well? Some of you think, I don't have a ministry at all. My life is just terrible and I suffer. Listen, if you suffer well in Jesus' name, do you know that's ministry? Do you know you get to show the people around you how powerful the gospel is, how how true and sure the promises of God are? But for that to happen, you got to keep the right paradigm. And it's the one that the Apostle Paul holds on to here. What's your paradigm for suffering? The second thing that we begin to see in this text that uh, 
Paul unfolds is the purpose of suffering. Now, this is a question that is probably bigger than the 22 or so minutes that I have left with you. What is the purpose of suffering? This has bothered theologians, philosophers, and podcast bros for all of history, right? Why do we suffer? You could find a million answers to this question in the culture, but what, what Paul begins to notice here is that in the gospel, this seemingly terrible thing, suffering, begins to purpose something. It begins to do something. It begins to accomplish something. And it wasn't way after the fact. It's been that way from the beginning. I want you to notice in verse 19, he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. Let's stop there for just a moment. Suffering is not just human. Suffering is everything. Everything, creation included, has been subjected to the brokenness of the fall. So, here's what's weird for me to think about as I was reading and thinking on this text. Like, have you you ever seen the Grand Canyon? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, if you, a lot of us in the room, it's majestic, right? Unbelievable. As majestic as the Grand Canyon is, that is the Grand Canyon subjected to futility. Like that is God's creation sort of suppressed and weighed down by the weight of fallen humanity. And what's interesting in verse 19 is that Paul says the creation itself waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What is he talking about there? He is talking about the day when the sons of God, his people, that's you, Christian, um, stand in full glory. Because guess what? It gets to be a package deal. Jesus will redeem his people, and he's going to redeem all of creation in recreating his world. And so the creation sits under the curse of suffering and sin and brokenness just like humans do. And then in verse 20, he says, that creation was subjected to, notice that word, futility. Futility. I think maybe the best physical illustration of futility is that of the hamster wheel, right? You can run really hard on a hamster wheel and you don't go very far, do you? It doesn't matter how many revolutions, it doesn't matter how much you've trained, that hamster wheel will begin at point A and end at point A. Why? Because the creation has been subjected to futility. These were the consequences as it says in the rest of verse 20, because of Him who subjected it. That's saying God who cursed the world after sin and brokenness entered it in Genesis chapter 3. These were the natural consequences, but here's, here's where the purpose of suffering begins to come in. He subjected it. He cursed the creation. What does the end of verse 20 say? In hope. God cursed the world in hope, what? Verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Here's how kind your father is. Even in cursing humanity for their sin, even in cursing and subjecting um, the creation He did it redemptively. He did it in hope, knowing that under the curse, one would come who would bear up underneath that curse, lifting its weight, breaking its strength forever. Verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It is no accident that Paul uses the illustration of childbirth right here. This is, pun intended, pregnant with meaning. 
I thought that was actually pretty funny, but it's okay. It's okay. Now, I've witnessed childbirth a few times. And of all the beauty, childbirth is a painful experience, is it not? But here's what I've noticed. In three births of three children, all of the pain, as soon as a healthy baby comes out, gives way to joy. It's like the most intense, painful, difficult moment ever. And then all of a sudden, the baby comes out, and it's like we don't even remember what just happened. Why? Because the pain was leading to something. The pain was redempted. The pain had a purpose. It was leading to something being born. And so Paul right here is using that very vivid illustration to remind our minds that, man, hey, all this suffering, all this pain for the Christian, it's producing something. It is training you for the world made right. It is training you for the glory to come. Listen, if you are in Christ, your suffering is not purposeless suffering. God is always doing something in you, around you, and through you every time you suffer. Every time. That does not mean that you have to enjoy suffering. It doesn't mean you have to like suffering. It doesn't mean you need to go looking for suffering. But what it does mean is that you must accept the kind hand of your father going, man, even this subjection, even being under this curse of sin, this was in hope. Even all of that, it's leading to something. There's glory that's going to break into the world at the end of all this. Keep going. If you forget that suffering has a purpose, you will lose strength. You've probably experienced shadows of this in your suffering before. Like, let's say, praise God, you have suffered well your entire life. I guarantee you've experienced at least moments where you looked up and you said, why in the world is this happening to me? What do I do? And you've sort of resigned from life in that moment. Man, I'm just as guilty of this as you are. Today is the day to confess the truth. Your enemy wants you to live under the weight of suffering in defeat and sadness. He wants you to suffer poorly. He wants the watching world to observe your suffering and for you to do it poorly so that they get to go, see, the gospel isn't powerful at all. That's what your enemy wants for you. But what your king wants to do is shape you in your suffering. He uses your suffering, as we'll find later in chapter 8, for the good of those who love him. Suffering is not without a purpose. It's not just creation that has been subjected, right? In verse 23, finishing up here, he says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even us who have the Spirit indwelling inside of us, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is an interesting verse saying, awaiting adoption. Paul just told us a few chapters ago that we've already been adopted. He gives us a clue exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the full consummation of that adoption, the redemption of our bodies, the day that you and I have a glorified body that we don't have to live under the weight of suffering any longer. He wants you to remember that. He wants you to remember that this is going somewhere, that there is purpose in this suffering. And then Paul finishes with these incredible words on patience and hope. And that's point number three today, patience in suffering. Read with me in verse 24, it says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it. 
with patience. Paul is saying, when we believe the gospel, it came with the hope of a future. We were saved in this hope. But he's saying right right now, in the time between of what some theologians would call the already but not yet, where we stand between the cross and the renewed creation, if we're going to hold on, if we're going to be patient in our suffering, we must become a people of hope. See, hope is not merely a feeling or a well-wish. Biblically, hope is a certainty of a future. Like as certain as this room is, right? As, as certain as you can feel the cup of coffee in your hands or feel the pages of the Bible that's in front of you. Paul's saying, I want you to believe on the future that God has promised with that kind of certainty, with that kind of belief that it's actually coming. I want you to hold on to that. And now, is hope easy? Of course not. That's why Paul would say to us, who hopes for what he sees? It's like, man, if it, if it was right in front of you, it wouldn't take any effort to hope in it. It's not hard for me to recognize that this cup is in my hands. Sometimes it's really hard for me to recognize that a future of glory is coming. It doesn't feel as present or as vivid to us as all the hard stuff of life, right? Right? But our hope is meant to be more than just an attitude. It's meant to be a way that we live. We get alerted to that in verse 25. He says, if we hope in what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That word patience there is sometimes translated as perseverance or diligence. You see, hope is not us just Suffering, sitting down and going, I'm just going to close my ears and hope I can make it until I die and get to glory. No biblical gospel hope says, I am going to put my hands on the plow and believe that what's being planted through this lifetime is going to grow into trees that either bless the next generation of the church or that glorify God in His coming. Hope is not just an internal attitude, it is an external expression. When you live with hope, guess what you do? You keep showing up to your life, even in the middle of suffering. When life gets really difficult, you remind yourself of the promises of God. This is why the community of faith is so essential to suffering well. Like this this whole book, right? Remember the context. It's written to a church. It's written to a collective people, not just an individual. If we are going to keep plowing, keep plodding along as we're suffering and experiencing difficulty, we are going to have to remind each other of future hope. I'm going to forget you're going to forget because the thing in front of us is more vivid than the hope in the future. See, one of the greatest ways that we can serve one another is by painting a vivid picture of God's future over one another's lives constantly. (laughs) To talk about the hope and the joy of the promises of the gospel. To remember that this isn't the end of the story. You are not... um, quote-unquote, Jesus-juking someone by reminding them of future hope. You are filling them with courage. We have been called by God to plow even in the seasons of suffering and difficulty. I, I debated even sharing this this morning, because what I don't want this to turn into is like a, oh, everybody feels so sad for Nick. That's not what I'm asking for. What I I want to tell you this morning is that I I experienced this with you. 
Uh, gosh, our community as a whole has experienced a loss in the last season, haven't we? Yesterday, I preached my grandfather's funeral. We, were, we found out that he died while we were on family vacation in Indianapolis after we got a flat tire and somebody broke into our van. <laughs> like, like all these things start stacking up where you, at some point you start, you start being tempted to live like this where you're waiting for the other shoe to drop on top of you, right? You've experienced this. And the temptation for me that moment is the same temptation for you to start giving up hope and to start living in constant fear that it's just only going to get worse forever. But as the people of God, we hold on to the promise of the future, right? I'm going to need you to remind me. I want to remind you, how are you suffering right now? Man, hold on to Jesus and receive what I think is probably the, what is the more important truth, that Jesus is holding on to you. And that someday, Revelation 21 gives us this vivid picture of the future, that He will wipe every tear from every eye, that death will be no more, that there will be no more crying or pain, because the former things will have passed away. That struggle you face with sin and addiction it will someday be a former thing. That loss of the loved one will someday be a former thing. That difficult relationship that you face that seems like you can never get on the same page, it will someday be a former thing bowed in full submission to the rule and reign of the king of the universe. you got to remember, if we're going to make it with hope, we got to remember future glory. And today I'm praying that we do. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just confess I just confess the temptation for myself and I know for all of us to suffer in a way that doesn't make much of you to suffer in a way that uh, we, just, we just flail instead of hold on to the steady hands of our Savior. And Jesus, we just want to grab on. We just want to take the life raft. We just want to hold on this morning, Lord. Some of us are in seasons of suffering or moments of suffering, and some of us you're preparing for seasons or moments of suffering. And so, Lord, I pray that you will empower and embolden us to hold on to Jesus through suffering. To genuinely believe with the Apostle Paul that the, the present sufferings are not worth comparing to the future glory. Holy Spirit, will you minister to the suffering today? Comfort the hurting. To those who feel like they're just barely hanging on today, Jesus, hang on to them. Remind them of the purpose. Remind them that you're doing something. Remind them that you're using it. Do a good work today in us, Father, and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we want to invite you to respond to the Word today here, and we typically do that in a couple of key ways. Number one, reflect. Just consider. Consider, where were you, where'd you hear God speak to you through His Word today? Talk to Him about your suffering. You've got an advocate, a friend, and a king in the resurrected Christ today. You've got Him. Go to Him. This is also a great time if you are struggling to hold on to Jesus as He's holding on to you as you suffer. We would love to pray for you. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to minister to you. And so I'll be in the back for a little bit during the second set of worship and would just love to pray for you. If you're a member at New City and you'd be willing to pray with people, I'd love to invite you back there as well to pray with others. The second way that we remember or the second way we respond is by remembering the Lord's death. 
remembering that we, we follow a Savior who went first in suffering who took the suffering and sins of his people upon himself and died in their place. And if you have yet to believe that, today is a great day to receive the suffering king as the Lord of your life. Just tell him, I'm going to give my life to you. Simple as that. This meal up here as we take the Lord's Supper where you'll find broken bread and a cup, this is, these, this is for followers of Jesus, and so I just encourage you, if that's not you yet today, this is a good moment to remain in your seat and ask, what would it look like to bow to Jesus as my King and Lord? And then finally, friends, we respond by rehearsing. And right? if you struggle to remember that glory is coming, every Sunday gets to be a dress rehearsal for that day. So if it's not very vivid, let it be vivid now. Sing with joy to the victorious King of the universe. New City, I love you. I love being your pastor. Respond when you're ready.